start off with a little housekeeping. This webinar is worth one ISA CEU. If you didn't enter your ISA certification number during registration, you can enter it into the questions box now for CEUs. If you have any questions, please enter them into the questions box and we'll address them at the end of the webinar. And just a reminder too, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available afterwards. On to the uh, introduction of me, the speaker. I'm Ken Tonnell, arborologist at Rainbow Companies. I've been an ISA board certified master arborist since 2007 and uh, just celebrated my 22 year anniversary at Rainbow Tree Care this month. So a uh, long timer here. I'm also serving as adjunct faculty in arboriculture at Hennepin Technical College in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. And if you want to contact me by email, at any point, uh, khonnell at rainbowtreecare.com is my uh, email address. And part of what I do as arborologist at Rainbow Tree Care, that's just basically the consultant behind the scenes of the consultants. And I provide a lot of technical training for our consulting arborist staff and our technicians as well. But there's a staff of about 16 consulting arborists. I'm responsible for their technical background, so it's their experience and mine that informs what I bring to these webinars. And that's focused in the Twin Cities area of Minnesota as well, so that's the, the regional perspective that I'm bringing to this too. Our intended outcomes today, we want to look at how mites differ from insects and cultural practices that benefit your whole situation and treating mite conditions. We'll look at the life cycles of cool season and warm season mites and dive in a bit to the diagnostic distinctions and monitoring for mites. And uh, last but not least, the treatment strategies for spider mites. What do you do about them? That's uh, really where the rubber hits the road is what do you do with these pests when they show up. So the first item on the list was how mites differ from insects. It's pretty easy. Mites have eight legs. Insects have six legs. Mites are not really insects at all. They're grouped on my treatment guide that I have with the sucking insects because they kind of work like that. They pierce and suck out plant juices and chlorophyll. So they're a crawly thing. They damage plant tissue, but they're not an insect. They're really more like spiders, arachnids. So it's a maybe an academic level distinction, but uh, you know something to keep in mind at any rate that they're, they're not really insects. And now I get to one of my favorite things in these uh, presentations that I do, whether it's the webinars or my technical meetings at Rainbow Tree Care or any of them, is to touch on the disease triangle concept from integrated pest management. It fits in, it shapes pretty much everything I do as an arborist, as a practitioner, and it's an underlying shaping concept to our practice. It seems so simple to be almost trivial at first glance. That basically refers to that uh, disease or an infestation of a pest doesn't really exist independently in the world outside of these conditions all being satisfied. You have to have a host plant and the pest has to be there, but that won't just automatically result in some kind of infestation or infection. The Environmental conditions have to be cooperating too to make it possible for that pest to infest the host. So, so simple as to be almost meaningless maybe is what one might think. You know, what uh, difference does that make to us? Well, it makes a difference because it opens up a lot of avenues for us to intervene in that situation that's not just automatically going to controlling the pest or the pathogen. If you've seen any of my other presentations, that lower right corner refers to pathogen. In this case, I've just changed that to pest because we're talking about spider mites. But if it's a fungus, it would be called a pathogen. If it's a creepy crawly thing, an insect, a mite, we'll refer to it as a pest. But the same underlying concept applies that if we change or modify the host, Maybe we don't have that pest on there at all. Or if we change or modify the environment, maybe the conditions change where that the host won't be attacked, that pest doesn't have the conditions to fully develop. 
or in some instances the environmental changes are such that it's beyond our ability to control it. But if you look at it through this perspective, it really helps you kind of understand what's going on in a lot of situations that we deal with as practitioners. So putting it into a context, I have used this slide a few times about why are spruces having such a hard time. Spruce, of course, is a major target for spider mites, the cool season spider mites that we'll look at. And when you look at this range map for Picea glauca or the white spruce, the native range of it, the southern fringe of that is northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, the upper parts of Michigan. And you'll notice that little blob out in South Dakota, that's where your Black Hill spruce comes from. But, you know, we all love to have our spruce trees, but even our location where I'm speaking from in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area of Minnesota, that's even outside the range of spruce trees. So when you've got a tree that's already going to have some challenges potentially, and you throw in a changing environment, intense heat, drought, alternating with deluge of rains, things like that happening, there's a greater level of stresses that are occurring on trees that are already outside their native range. So species like spruce that are at the southern end of that range, they'll suffer more as the climate is clearly changing to different patterns than what we've been used to. And part of the environment too, of course, is soil. And to a degree that's open to our influence to change with amendments or maybe not, depending how far off the optimum it is. But when you look at what is the optimum for conifers, that pH is 5.5 which I know in our area is almost never showing up in a soil test. We're more typically approaching 8.0 pH. So if we don't have soil to support the trees that want to grow optimally, uh, it's going to be a much more difficult time and more pests will attack that because the host is stressed. Again, fitting it into the disease triangle, a stressed host is an easier target. And when the environment is cooperating to make all of this happen. It's more of an uphill battle. A little note on the bottom of this uh, picture too is most of the soil tests that I have archived that come from our metropolitan region, there's low levels of potassium and other nutrients and potassium has a big role in influencing the water balance in trees and it reduces the winter hardiness of these evergreen species when it's deficient. And we've been, I think, walking by that for years looking for mites, looking for insects and fungi that are not there, but spruce dropping needles apparently due to nutrient deficiencies. So I don't want to, I could spend the whole time here talking about soils and nutrient deficiencies, but I need to keep it focused more towards spider mites. But in this particular case here, modifying the environment when it is open to our control, when there is a drought, doing things like supplemental watering, you reduce the opportunity for the pathogen or the pest to attack, increase the vigor of the host so it's less likely to be a target, and then the likelihood of or severity of a disease or an infestation will be reduced. Just a thing like a soaker hose goes a long way towards reducing the rate of spider mite attack on spruce trees, keeping it well watered and reducing tree stress with all other cultural practices like mulching and prescription organic matter. It's just our term for when we go in with an air spade and decompact soils around the base of trees and mix in compost and biochar. We're just making a more ideal setting for our tree roots to grow in and organic matter, improving all the chemical, physical, and biological properties in that soil surrounding a tree. So to the degree you can, making the environment more positive for the host to be healthy reduces the likelihood that a pest infestation will happen or it will reduce its severity. Again, I go back to the soaker hose. The drought stress trees are the ones more attractive for targets for spider mites. And if you're using a soaker hose, the water that you do use is more efficiently placed, soaking in slowly to the base of the tree not getting lost to evaporation or inadvertently causing fungal problems in the foliage of the trees. So all of this relates to 
how do you manage the factors within your control in the disease triangle to favor the host and not favor the pest or a pathogen? So to move it on to our main topic now that I've been able to make my little obligatory uh, reference to the disease triangle, spider mites are a good case of how this all fits together. Uh, as I mentioned, they, they do like to attack the stressed trees, especially drought-stressed ones. Their way of attacking the tree is with mouth parts that are called chelicerae. They use that to puncture at the host tissue. It looks almost like something from a science fiction movie there in the left, but that's under magnification what the mouth parts actually look like. And when you look at the resulting damage to tissues, in the upper picture is an oak leaf. There's kind of that dull, dotted, they call it stippling. And on arborvitaes, it's pretty common too. See, it's just like little puncture sites that where the chlorophyll gets sucked out. That's what's causing that flecked, stippled surface, is the puncturing, sucking action of the spider mites. <clears throat> so the life cycles, there's two rough categories of spider mites, the cool season and warm season mites. And there's shown here rough graphic of during the calendar of the year, the cool season mites have two windows of time when they're operating in the spring and the fall. Warm season ones, as the name would imply, they're active during the summer. Now they're on different hosts. The cool season spider mites are the ones you'll find on the conifers. Chiefly the spruce trees are the main target in our area, but you see it plenty of times on arborvitaes, to a lesser extent on pines, firs, and junipers, but probably 80% are on spruces and the rest I find them on arborvitaes but don't be surprised to find them on other conifers as well. And when you look at them under magnification, they look like that uh, thing on the lower left. In the life cycle, they're going to spend the winter as eggs on twigs or in the webbing that they spin. Again, they're kind of related to spiders, so they sometimes make webbing. It's not always there on the twigs. Sometimes you can mistake that if there's cottonwood trees in the vicinity that are blowing that fluffy stuff around it lodges in the spruce branches so that can be deceiving but other times you know the webbing can result from spider mite activity too and again with magnification the eggs are shown here in the picture they're kind of those rusty reddish shiny blobs that are at the base of the needle or along the length of the twig so the overwintering eggs hatch in the spring right about now, and then when it gets to be into that 80 degree range, they just go dormant. There's eggs that will spend the summer just hanging out there. And then once it starts cooling off again in the fall, they lay more eggs and there's another wave of activity for the cool season spider mites come September, October or so. So for diagnosing and monitoring, there's the famous uh, paper shake test where all you do is just take a branch of the spruce tree or whichever host you're monitoring and hold a white sheet of paper underneath that branch and give it a good vigorous shake. And these mites will fall down onto that paper. And they are about the size of if you have black pepper that you shake out on there. And the spider mites, the ones that you're worried about are the slow moving ones and you'll maybe see fast moving ones running around on the sheet of paper also. Generally the fast moving ones are predators feeding on the slower moving ones. But if you have more than 10 mites per branch that you shake out on that paper, that's considered the threshold for treatment. At least according to Penn State Extension in their College of Ag Sciences. The former story or the lore about doing this paper shake test was you can smear your hand over that piece of paper and you see the streaks. And if they were green ones, that means those are the ones that were feeding on chlorophyll and those are the bad guys. And if it streaks red, those are the predators. And if the red outnumbers the green, let the predators do their work and don't treat. But other sources I've talked to at Ohio State, they've said well, you can't just count on color of a streaked spider mite when you smear it on the paper. It's not that easy to distinguish between the two. So basically go with that 
10 mites per branch on a paper shake as your treatment threshold. So under magnification, you'll see that stippled flecked surface. That again is the extraction of chlorophyll. And if you look for adults and eggs of spider mites with a hand lens, everyone with a hand lens, you'll be able to diagnose lots of different things. But it's really especially important with uh, diagnostics for mite conditions. And my favorite tool for it is this one called the Magnoscope. The brand is Carson brand. And you can find these, look on Amazon for about $50 or so. And it's an amazing tool, dual purpose magnifier. You unscrew the far end of this thing and then it's a spotting scope. You can look at things really far away or up high in a tree. If you're looking for, say, D-shaped exit holes of bronze birch borer in a birch tree or things like that, it's much easier to spot from the ground if you're using this powerful scope. And this is really tiny but very powerful. Then put that second lens piece back on there and it's like a handheld microscope. You can quite readily see spider mite eggs, the active adults with this scope on there. I've been doing that a lot lately as we're right into the range of the hatch here in Minnesota. And this can be a good tool also for showing these things to your clients. You know, if you really want to get the point across to a client, uh, seeing is believing, right? You know, you get the thing focused in and show it to the customer and say, yeah, those little round things are the eggs or see the crawly ones. Those are the spider mites that are causing trouble for your tree. So the Magnoscope, I've outfitted all of the consulting arborist group, all 16 of them in their kits have this tool and we rely on it pretty heavily. Really good thing to have in your diagnostic bag. So while you're looking with the magnification on the spruce trees, you can look for fruiting bodies too. If there's needle cast fungus, it's not to say that both aren't present at the same time. They often are. You know, your Colorado blue spruce, of course, that's almost synonymous with uh, rhizosphere needle cast. But check it also when you're zooming in looking for those mites and the mite eggs. Check for those black fruiting bodies popping up out of the stomata because then that indicates you have uh, needle cast fungus also. But a way to distinguish between the two, you'll, you can look at the general pattern also. Needle cast will be found concentrated in the lower interior part of the tree because you know with fungal things they want to they get started where it's more humid, it's shady. The one in the picture here looks like it's crowded with some other trees around it. And that lower three or four feet, that's where the needle cast fungi tend to start, especially where that sprinkler system hits the needles and keeps them wet quite regularly. By contrast, Mites are going to be able to distribute themselves more throughout the tree, and they're not going to be confined just to lower interior parts of the crown of a tree. They can hop around and get blown around on the wind a bit. Even I've heard that birds landing in the tree, the mites can sort of hitchhike their way along to other parts of the tree or other trees in the vicinity, just kind of catching a ride on birds that are passing through there. Now, I always like to give a shout out to extension services too. For monitoring or tracking of pests, there's all kinds of sources that have weekly emailed integrated pest management reports. And my two favorites are the Ohio State Buckeye Yard and Garden Line and the University of Maryland Nursery IPM report. And you can just sign up and get this emailed to you weekly. So extension services around the country do such great work with helping to monitor pests and provide information. And for sure, Ohio and Maryland are a long distance from Minnesota. And we've got great extension in Minnesota too, but I like this because they have similar lists of pests in Ohio and in Maryland, but it happens about two to three weeks ahead of when we'll get them up here in the cold northern tundra. So by knowing that, you know, in Probably in March they might start getting it in Maryland. That means in a couple of weeks in April, it will show up most likely in Minnesota. So extension services have a lot to offer. And a lot of 
what I like to tune into in these IPM reports is growing degree days. And growing degree days are a tracking method I found very effective because it reduces chasing down all kinds of phenology data like the lilacs bloom, the forsythias bloom, and what zip code or whatever, that's all fine. But if I just want to track a number that is pretty accurate, the growing degree day formula is, is very effective. It's been about four or five years now I've been using it. And if you don't know what growing degree days are, it's just an accumulated unit of heat measurement. You take the high and the low temperature for a given day, add them together, divide it by two to average that, then subtract 50 is your base temperature that is typically used. That gives you a number that's the heat units accumulated for that day and it's added to every, well, the, the total of what happened previous to that day in that season. And for most of the insects and mites, it's been figured out what number of heat units it takes to get them to hatch or to show up. So 10 caterpillar is 90 growing degree days. Sawfly is around 240. We know that Japanese beetle shows up at 1,000. And on the left, I have the column of the date where that might be a typical date historically of when that's happening. But if I'm going along saying, well, OK, May 5th, I got to be ready for tent caterpillar. Well, those historical dates I'm finding are becoming decreasingly meaningful or increasingly meaningless as things shift. We're typically about two to three weeks ahead of the 30-year average right now where we are in Minnesota. But if I'm tracking growing degree days, I don't really have to worry about what the calendar says because that fluctuates wildly. But by tracking the growing degree days, I know what's going on in my location in real time. So this year, actually at 10 Caterpillar, we were at 90 growing degree days about a week ago. You know, and here it is. It's not even the end of April yet. So May 5th, that's what it would have been on a 30-year average. But again, using growing degree days, whether you get that from the extension bulletins or whichever source, really good way to keep track of your uh, pests that are developing in the landscape. And it will come into play here when it comes time to send your treatments out too. So your peak activity for the cool season spider mites in that spring end is going to be 192 to 363 growing degree days. So you can start looking at, in that 50 to 120 growing degree days, that's right about where we are now in Minneapolis-St. Paul. Treat those mites with Lepitect. I'll say more about Lepitect coming up here pretty soon. Uh, another window when you can treat with Lepitect systemic is towards the fall, and that's mapped out with degree days too, as it starts getting towards 2400 growing degree days. There are the, are the couple of windows of opportunity to get the treatments in there. So Lepitect, if you're not familiar with that already, it's a soil applied systemic insecticide. It's acephate, which in years before when I was a plant health care tech, it was something that we applied as a spray, but as a Lepitect formulation, soil applied systemic, the mode of action is it disrupts the nerve system of the insect and paralyzes it. And the great thing here is one soil application gives you 30 days of control. So it can be an effective uh, product to use where you want to have something that works for a specific amount of time and then it's gone. You know, I could talk briefly about with Japanese beetle, that's important, where we don't want a systemic for a long term in the pollen stream of a tree that's a flowering tree like lindens. And there's a broad range of what Lepitec takes care of. As the name implies, Lepidopteran insects, like the caterpillars, but the spider mites, it's very effective on those. And then a list of other things too, aphids, Japanese beetles, sawflies, et cetera, et cetera. And it's applied by the HTI injector system. So you can get a very accurate dosage on that with that piece of technology. But very versatile systemic to have in the toolkit and very effective against the spider mites. So the cool season and the warm season spider mites, the note to uh, uh, emphasize here, it doesn't kill the egg stage. So 
you could still end up having, you could control the active feeding adults, but the eggs that they lay could still be there and you won't have those killed, so it could show up as another resurgence afterwards. So if you're showing up on a site and you do the paper shake test, you find a high population that's going on. There's a Bayer product called Forbid. The active in that is spiromasophen, and it controls all the life stages, the eggs, the larvae, the nymphs, the adults, the whole lifespan of spider mites. So very effective in knocking down that existing population. If your treatment timing is a little bit off, you didn't get there in that 50 to 120 growing degree days range, you can do a contact spray with Forbid to take care of that. One thing on that subject with systemic insecticides, Zytec or Minocloprid, some conifer pests you treat with this product that's very effective against, say, your spruce bud scale or sawflies or adelgids, a, a whole list of sucking insects and some chewing insects on the conifers. You can treat with a metacloprid, but be aware that sometimes you see mite flare-ups that come after a Zytec treatment. And studies have pointed to, does it increase the attractiveness because the plant gets healthier? Or I don't know if that makes sense, if mites attack the stress trees and you make the tree healthier. But these are just various bits of lore I've picked up over the years. Does the plant become a better food source, or does it speed up the mite's reproductive ability? Does it uh, kill off the mite predators? Any combination of those things. Fact is, we see mite flare-ups with this occasionally, so be ready to deal with that. Monitor those cases where you're treating a conifer with Zytec. Be ready to spray forbid if there's an outbreak that's going on there. You can treat with the Lepitec that I mentioned to anticipate before the egg hatch if the tree has a history of mites. Or if you're applying Zytec at a time when mites are active, you can tank mix Lepitec in there to give it kind of a, a double coverage. So you can treat that primary insect and then be ready to have the mites controlled as well. Now, fitting in here, is I didn't want to just gloss over aerophyids of conifers. Uh, mostly when we hear about aerophyid mites, they're known as a gall-forming insect, or not an insect, a gall-forming pest on deciduous trees, the things that make spindle gall and ash flower gall, the weird deformations of plant tissue, mostly on deciduous trees, but we'll also hear about them as rust mites and that kind of thing in Christmas tree plantations. They're increasingly common on spruce and white pine. It's not the gall-forming ones, but ones that are going after chlorophyll in conifer needles. We don't know a huge amount about the phenology of when they get active. It seems like when spring arrives, they just start getting active and they're going all season long, potentially, all the way through the season. And it can be confused. The symptoms, aerophyte infestation in conifers, We've thought for a long time, is it chlorosis or just winter injury, drought, herbicide, or those things are going on and the mites just make that worse. It might be all of the above going on there. But you'll get a pale yellow to bronze needles on that current season's growth. Now the picture in the lower right, that's last season's growth. It's not current growth because I just wanted to contrast that. You'll see chlorosis in spruce needles too and throw in aerophyid mites, they're super tiny, it can be easy to evade detection because if you look at this in this picture, that green band there is a white pine needle and you know how skinny a white pine needle is. Look in that yellow circle there and there's a little carrot shaped thing that's kind of clear orangey colored, that's an aerophyid mite on a white pine needle. So you can find them with that Carson magnoscope, I did it last week on some spruce trees, but you really have to look pretty closely, even with that heavy magnification. You need at least a 15 power lens to see them. The magnoscope was more powerful than that. And really with the area five mites, I'd say we're still on the learning curve. We know that Lepitect, the systemic, doesn't work on the area five mites. Forbid spray does. We've had good results with that. And um, 
aracinate I'll talk about a little bit here. That's a trunk injection or root flare injection systemic. That's had some good results for us. And treating the larger trees, larger spruces and pines, you have to be aware of avoiding chemical trespass. Most of our spray equipment, we've reduced our reach to 30, 35 feet with smaller spray guns to avoid having stuff drift all over the place. So that's something to balance in when you're looking at the, the host tree. Uh, how readily are you going to be able to avoid the overspray on some of these sites? Now, aracinate, it's another systemic miticide or insecticide, not a soil applied thing though. We'd use this with micro injection systems for a wide variety of mites and insects where soil application or foliar spray is not an option. Like you've got really big trees and it's on a property boundary where you don't want to have drift. And the treatments can be done through the growing season. And we've had good results with the area of five mites on spruce. But operationally, it's just tricky. Well, for one thing, spruce trees tend to be branched really low to the ground. So your applicator has to go kind of belly crawl under through these branches and twigs. and the uptake is very slow. It took hours to inject one tree, whereas on uh, deciduous trees that we do root flare injections, it's less than an hour and there's uptake. So that's kind of our benchmark is, you know, we're used to having product go into trees relatively quickly, but you're sitting there waiting for this stuff for hours to get uptake into a spruce. But once it's there, it does seem to work. But Operationally, it's just a kind of a sluggish thing to try to inject a conifer. Now onto warm season mites. These are the ones you'll see on deciduous hosts. In our area, that's mostly honey locust, oak trees, sometimes cherries, crab apples, pear trees. But it's similar presentation with that stipple, the dull looking surface. We're not zoomed in close enough to the honey locust to see that actual damage, but the drought stressed parking lot trees tend to be the ones that really get it. If you had a high magnification, you could see the two spotted spider mite named because of the two spots on its back. In the case of the warm season mites, it's that gap in between when the cool season ones are attacking conifers and the adult it only takes a few days in warm weather between that 912 to 1500 growing degree days when it's above 80 degrees or in the 80 degree range the warm season spider mites can really blow up in the populations with multiple generations per year so just have to be monitoring and be ready to deal with those if you can get in there say you know ahead of time you know from a previous summer that you had spider mites in a tree Look to put that Lepitec down at 227 degree days or so, but monitor, continue to monitor May through June on those sites and try to get the treatment in there before the raging outbreaks occur during that peak activity. Now, as you get towards the tail end of that uh, summer season, wouldn't really make sense to apply Lepitec because your 30-day residual time will span into the fall when they're going to be tailing off their activity anyway. So, you know, the earlier part of the summer, that's why it says monitoring May through June, because you start getting past that and it's less of an opportune window for Lepitec activity to be of use for you. If you are getting into that later end of the season, that's when you may need to switch to a forbid spray to knock down that population. And again, just to reiterate, spiromesophen will get will take care of your eggs, the larvae, the nymphs, adults, but whatever stage they're at, it'll take care of them. So if the treatment timing is off, a good product to fall back on. So just wrapping it up here, if you water and mulch your trees, they'll have fewer mites and other pests. It's just a way of uh, increasing the defenses of the host and reducing the bad parts of the environment, to what degree it's in your control. And monitoring for spider mites is relatively easy. You have some magnification, a hand lens is helpful, but one of those magnoscopes is even better. You can see all kinds of fun things. It's actually kind of addictive. It's fun to 
look at all kinds of stuff under high magnification. So it's pretty easy to keep track of these things and growing degree days will help you out a lot too. If you're not using those, I highly recommend for your IPM program to get a growing degree days chart and start mapping out your pest treatments accordingly with that. The treatment strategies for the cool and warm season mites are pretty much the same, but just at different times. The forbid spray for the existing population and Lepitec soil application for longer residual for 30 days of activity against spider mites. And lots of other diagnostic information and pictures and things. It's available at www.treecarescience.com in the Diagnostic Guides page. So I recommend you check out that site. A lot of good information there. So if you have any questions um, afterwards, you know, you can contact me at khonel at rainbowtreecare.com. And let's see if we have any questions coming in here. Oh, we've got a bunch. So reasons for increased populations after applications. Imidacloprid can kill predatory mites, yep. That can feed on other mite species. Right. That's uh that was one of the, the pieces that I've heard of too is that the predators get killed off so you can get a rebound. But yeah, in any case, be monitoring for that. If you're treating a conifer with a metacloprid, monitor for spider mites after that, because it happens often enough that we seen from experience, you need to be ready to deal with the mites that pop up. Do you know of a miticide that is specific to mites and will not harm insects? There's a couple of sites where we released biological controls for hemlock woolly adelgid. Hemlocks are heavily infested with spruce spider mite. Hmm, that's an interesting one. Um, I don't think I know of that. I mean, unless if you're using some of the horticultural oil products, and I've shied away from the hort oils on a lot of our hosts for spider mites, like the blue spruce, because that can result in a loss of that nice blue color. But maybe that's something to look at on those hemlocks. But yeah, we should take note of that and see if we can get you a better answer about that one. We'd have to look into that. What do you recommend for Norway spruce with spider mites and pine needle scale in the Louisville area, treatment options and timing. Well, spider mites, lepitectin forbid, of course, for that. And then the pine needle scale, that's an armored scale. So those, what we tend to use those on those is transtect because armored scales, you respond well, the tree responds well with transtect. You know, the uh, imidacloprid is not a molecule that will go in to get the armored scales. And timing for the transtect application, because spruce needle scale, I think your crawlers hatch, you get two waves of them, around 300 degree days, and then later, this is just off the top of my head, around 1200. So what I would do is get transtect in there right about now. You'll get two week uptake and then a 60 to 90 day length of time where it will span over both of those generations of the pine needle scale. So get a, a transtect in there now and monitor for the spruce spider mites and just treat those as you need to with forbid and or lepitect. Oh, what about using high pressure water spray to reduce the number of mites, insecticidal soaps? Uh, yeah by all means, anything that's a mechanical or biological control, I don't mean to ignore those kind of things. Um, you know, you may need to be able to go back to a site frequently with some of those things. And that's kind of why operationally we haven't done as much of that, but maybe a homeowner has the ability to do that more readily than we do because, you know, we, we'd have to charge accordingly if we're going back out frequently and that's kind of gets to be the bottleneck for us doing some of the biological or mechanical level controls is there's less longer term residual activity so it's more site visits and more monitoring and if people are willing to pay for that we can do that um, so yeah by all means any means necessary and then you're not having 
off-target effects on other kinds of uh, creatures as well. Mite damage on Arborvitae is towards the bottom. Is that I'm assuming towards the bottom of the plant. Uh, I've seen it distributed around. I mean, maybe not all the way to the top. Uh, that's, I think, what they're probably referring to. And lastly, we have, do systemics have any effect on area of five mites, especially on viburnum, nine bark, and ash? Well, with uh, ash flower gall, specifically, we use Lepitect on those. And we're seeing maybe a 50% control on that. With uh, the gall forming things in general, I think of it as like, um, a mosquito bite. The, the gall is a result of the feeding of that creature and the reaction of the tissue. So I slapped the mosquito, I killed the causal agent, so I've controlled the pest. But I still get that itchy red welt on my arm. And whether you treat an areophyte on a deciduous tree for galls with a spray or the systemic with Lepitect, it's the feeding that initiates the plant reaction. So maybe they ingest enough to kill the pest but you still end up getting that reaction in the tissues. So we, we tend to not try to push a lot of those because it's in most cases just a aesthetic level of damage and we don't end up getting a great level of control on them either. So Lepitec timing again. Apply right before egg hatch or can you after egg hatch but within activity range for mites? Yeah, before egg hatch is ideal. Um, after egg hatch, yeah, you know, if you get it before the population is is super high and getting out of range, you know, depending on, I mean, maybe the overall look of the tree is not so far gone. You know, you could rely on the Lepitec to stay in place for that 30-day residual time and knock down that population. If it's a really high population and the tree is under some pretty heavy pressure from it, that's when I'd throw in the forbid just to get that quick knockdown and get the eggs knocked out too. So I would base that kind of on what's the level of the infestation and the history of it. But yeah, if you can get the Lepitect before the raging population starts, that's the best way to go after that. So great questions. Hopefully I've answered them all adequately here. Oh, I got a comment there, sweet beard. Thanks. Yeah, I had trimmed it back too. I was in competition. The first guy in the slide is Paul Shonicky. He's the beard king of the company. But then my beard, I was trying to catch up to him. I trimmed it back a few weeks ago because I couldn't strap my uh, helmet on for a pruning seminar. Okay. Great. Yeah. Well, if there's no other questions, I'll just wrap it up then. And I thank everyone for attending. Hope you uh, got some good. Oh, here's one more question. Will soil applied asphate help reduce mite outbreaks and reduce beneficials damage? Oh, damage to beneficials. Yeah, I'd say, um, you know, because it's targeted uh, a systemic that's affecting just the pest, it's less likely that your beneficials would get killed off by that too. When you're applying sprays, foliar applications, it's kind of more indiscriminate that it could apply in there. I mean, even horticultural oils, that suffocating things, that could end up going on a beneficial. So I would say, yeah, arguably, soil applied acephate could reduce some of the off-target damage on some of the, the creatures you want to keep around. But yeah, in the whole scheme of things, make sure that you're managing the site to increase the vigor of the host, reduce the stresses from the environment, take into account that whole disease triangle. I always stress that because then, if nothing else, it, it gives you a chance to have the customer on your side enrolled in what they can do and helping you out. And it takes you out of the spot that you're stuck in, that you have to spray your way out of every problem. You kind of put the wind at your back by having the client manage the site or you recommend the, the full picture of what can help the situation. So it's not just like the spray is the way out of everything.
that makes sense. Okay. Thanks everyone for attending and I hope it was great. Uh, go out there and do good IPM. Thank you. <laughs>